Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Talks Artificial Intelligence presented by Google. I'm Jennifer Hollett. I am the Executive Director. Yes! Thank you. It's so nice to be back in person and to feel that energy. I'm the Executive Director of the Walrus, and I will be your host this evening. We are thrilled to be back here in Toronto at the Isabel Bader Theatre, and we're also streaming online live at thewalrus.ca. Hello to the over 1,000 households who have registered for this live stream. Yeah, round of applause for everyone tuning in from home. What's been great is through the live stream, we're able to carry on this conversation across the country and around the world. Now, we encourage all of you, wherever you're watching this, to share this conversation on social media. So you can tag us at The Walrus on any of the social platforms, and you can use our hashtag, hashtag Walrus Talks. A hashtag is a great way for us to connect the IRL, in real life audience, and our audience at home. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered within the bounds of Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, this land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, Toronto is home to a diversity of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We are honored at the Walrus to carry on a long tradition of storytelling, and we encourage you, wherever you are, to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on. This year, the Walrus turns 20, and that's either really young or really old, <laughs> depending how old you are or how long you've been working in media. And we are really proud to be celebrating 20 years of Canada's conversation, taking a look at who we are now. You can find our stories wherever you're looking for them. So that can be online at thewalrus.ca. We're also available in print on newsstands, or you can subscribe to The Walrus. We also have podcasts, and we have events like this one, which you're a part of. And this work is made possible by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So thank you all for being here, and especially to Google for partnering with us on this event. To open up this conversation, please welcome to the stage right now, Sam Sebastian, who is the Vice President of Google Cloud Canada. I didn't get the screams like you okay, got for the introduction. Jeez. It's just, just like high school. It reminds me just of high school. Um, on behalf of Google, welcome to tonight's Walrus Talks. Uh, I, I, we're so excited uh, to be able to sponsor this event. Uh, for nerdy technology folks uh, like myself and for maybe some in the, in the audience, the last six months or so have been really interesting to watch artificial intelligence, generative AI become a uh, topic of around a dining room table in addition to boardroom tables. That, that's what we're kind of used to. Um, but it's important to remember artificial intelligence has been around for years, and you might just not realize that you've been using it, whether it's driving directions on your phone or um, your email, uh, uh, finishing your sentences, uh, or finding videos on YouTube or, or other, uh, other platforms. Artificial intelligence is behind the scenes making that all go. Uh, but over the last probably four to six months, generative AI have, have generated a ton of interest, uh, lots of opportunities, but also lots of risks. Uh, and so tonight, it's going to be, it's exciting for us to participate in this particular event to get some great perspectives some, from some really intelligent folks that are at the forefront of all of this. Um, and it's clear to us, I mean, we're, we're kind of change optimists, and so we all, always think technology can change the world, and, and we believe generative AI is like that as well. But now more than ever, and with this particular technology, we have to make sure we get it right. Uh, and so ensuring we have the guardrails and a lot of the other things in place, uh, and you'll hear about some of that tonight. Uh, so let's get started. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sam. Artificial intelligence, or AI, as Sam mentioned, we, the human species, we've been thinking about AI for a while, for over 200 years. Think man versus machine. 
When it was first discussed, one of the questions that would come up was whether machines with learning capability would replace humans as the dominant species. We've read about that in a lot of science fiction books. Cut to today where we're still asking versions of ultimately the same question, but now with AI built into our digital world and reality, the questions are becoming more fine-tuned, more specific. What does this mean for jobs? What does this mean for my job? What does this mean for my life? Could it make things easier? Maybe even better? Could it make things worse? Tonight, our talkers will explore how artificial intelligence is impacting us today and how it may impact us over the next few years. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Dr. Graham Taylor, Professor in Canada Research Chair in Machine Learning, University of Guelph, Research Director, Vector Institute, and Canada CIFAR AI Chair. Dr. Golnoush Fernandi, Assistant Professor, McGill University, Core Academic Member, Mila, Canada CIFAR AI Chair. Mike Branch, Vice President, Data and Analytics, Geotab. Dr. Devin Singh, Emergency Physician and Lead, Clinical AI and Machine Learning in Pediatric Emergency Medicine, SickKids, Co-Founder and CEO, Hero AI. Craig Oliva, Director of Google Cloud Customer Engineering, Canada. Mariel Marshall, Artist and Entrepreneur, Blue Mouth Inc. in Tandem Experiences. And Navneet Alang, Tech Columnist with the Toronto Star, Thank you to these brains for joining us. Hello, I'm Graham Taylor. I'm a professor at the University of Guelph, and I'm the research director at the Vector Institute for AI. As tonight's opener, I was asked by the organizers to define artificial intelligence. I think about AI in two ways. First, it's a multidisciplinary field of study that focuses on the development of systems that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. Its applications span various domains, including healthcare, finance, education, transportation, entertainment, and with the potential to transform many others, which you will hear about this evening. My alternate definition of AI is a goal the goal to build machines that can not only perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, but to enable machines to mimic or even surpass human cognitive abilities across a wide range of domains and tasks. And some refer to this end state as artificial general intelligence. It's this latter perspective, backed by claims from prominent researchers about our proximity to achieving such AI, that truly sparks our imagination and curiosity. And despite some concerns about AI's trustworthiness and safety, we're here to explore tonight its potential for a brighter future. My focus is on AI for biodiversity, an arena that deserves our attention, while at the same time is an invigorating place for advanced AI research. There's often a divide between fundamental and applied research. On one side, those who want to advance AI capabilities develop on abstract, benchmark data sets that's detached from real-world applications. On the other side, those who want to pursue applications in AI are typically confined to pre-existing techniques due to the practical complexities of real-world implementation. However, AI and biodiversity brings forth unique challenges that push at the boundaries of modern deep learning. Biodiversity, essentially the diversity of life on Earth, has more than just scientific importance. It shapes our lives and our planet's health. Yet despite its significance, biodiversity has suffered severe declines. Between 1970 and 2016, vertebrate species populations dropped by an average of 68%. And what's behind this decline? Climate change, pollution, invasive species and disease, overexploitation of species, and changes in land use and sea use, including housing development and unsustainable agriculture. Monitoring and reversing biodiversity loss is a daunting task, yet we're nearing the creation of cost-efficient methods that yield faster, 
high volume biodiversity data. And AI holds the key to harnessing this data for economic, policy, and regulatory use. As machine learning researchers face with a problem as big as biodiversity, we often first ask, well, what's the data? I'm part of a collaboration led by the University of Ibiscala, University of Helsinki, and Duke University called LifePlan. LifePlan aims to build a planetary inventory of life and has enrolled more than 100 teams worldwide to collect different types of biodiversity data. Large tents called malaise traps passively collect flying insects, yielding DNA and images. Cyclone samplers literally suck DNA out of the air and soil samples are analyzed for fungal DNA. Camera traps photograph animals in day at night, and audio moss record bird and bat sounds. My team zeroes in on DNA barcodes and imagery. DNA barcoding is a technique developed at the University of Guelph that uses a short, standardized segment of DNA. Despite its reliability for species identification, DNA barcoding is costly and time-consuming. Hence, we're creating computer vision techniques for quick, in the field identification and bulk identification of hundreds of thousands to thousands of insects in a single image. Identifying plant and insect species presents unique challenges compared to mainstream computer vision. For instance, class imbalance, where a few species dominate the data with just a few samples for others, makes it very difficult to learn the rare classes. The problem is also fine-grained, which means very, very similar species are hard to tell apart. And unlike popular data sets like ImageNet, where AI has surpassed human performance for some time, here a trained botanist or entomologist outperforms the best AI systems. Biodiversity science has introduced me to a range of intriguing machine learning problems, despite working in the field for a long time. Open world recognition refers to the ability of a model to recognize and categorize new, previously unseen classes in real world scenarios, beyond those that it was initially trained on. In biodiversity, recognizing known species and discovering new species are equal, uh, equally important. Set value classification, where a model outputs a subset of possible classes for a given input, like an image, this reflects human-like capabilities, offering a narrowed down set of options while maintaining uncertainty. Biodiversity introduces us also to hierarchical rather than flat class structure. Taxonomic classification uses algorithms to categorize classes according to linear and taxonomy, from kingdom all the way down to species. So looking forward, the technologies that excite me most include non-destructive passive traps like Diopsis that can collect imagery without killing specimens and they don't need human intervention. Nanopore sequencing, which promises the capability to sequence DNA in the field rather than in the lab. And as we have done with language, the opportunity to build foundation models for biodiversity data on top of efforts like LifePlan and the Canadian-led Bioscan. Machine learning for biodiversity yields many interesting technical problems that inspire researchers like me. And ultimately our goal is to de drive desired future behaviors in the ecosystem to improve life for us and for future generations. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. Um, my name is Golnush Farnadi, and I'm assistant professor at the School of Computer Science at McGill University. I am also core academic member at Mila Quebec AI Institute, which is the largest AI lab in the world. I am also one of the Canada CIFAR AI shareholders. Today, I want to discuss a critical issue that demands our attention, the risk of algorithm discrimination. Let me start with a question. So who knows what is algorithm discrimination? Can you raise your hand? Yes. <laughs> Couple of people, good, good. So the topic of algorithmic discrimination has become the driving force behind my career, and I'm eager to shed lights on its importance. 
My journey into this field began during my PhD where I focused on user profiling and personality prediction based on digital footprints. Upon completing my research, I was shocked when I um, approached by companies that they had the intention of using my model for hiring purposes. It was then that I realized the potential consequences of algorithm discrimination. Imagine a 50-year-old man, highly skilled, extrovert, um, who is perfect for a job for the extrovert, um, but who is missing out on job opportunities for extroverts simply because an AI model wrongly perceives him as an introvert due to his limited presence on social media. This is the alarming reality we face. Unfortunately, AI systems, despite their numerous benefits that we are going to hear today, actually, are not immune to errors. Even small errors can have significant consequences on people's lives and harm individuals. In our increasingly AI-driven world, algorithms have considerable power. They determine who gets hired, who receives loans, who gets a house, who faces sentencing, and even who receives proper health care and correct diagnosis. Unfortunately, my research has revealed that real-world applications of AI model often fall short in terms of fairness. Let me provide some examples. Hiring ads tend to favor men for highly paid or technical roles. Facial recognition technology employed in predictive policing disproportionately targets and discriminates black communities. Risk assessment software used across courts shows higher risk for black people, leading to unjust sentencing. Credit cards are more easily approved for men. Disease diagnoses work poorly on the elderly, and this list goes on and on, which illustrates the profound inequalities extended by current AI models. To understand AI bias, we must grasp how AI learns. Modern AI system relies on vast amounts of data, historical records, human interactions, and societal patterns. But what happens when the data itself is biased? Unfortunately, bias within the data can influence the algorithms, resulting in biased outcomes. For instance, if historical hiring data reflects a preference for a certain gender or ethnicity, or if certain demographics are underrepresented in the data, the AI system may unintentionally amplify this bias by favoring a specific subpopulation in future hiring decisions. The unintentional consequence of AI bias can be far-reaching. Imagine an AI-powered resume screening tool that wrongfully rejects qualified candidates based on biased historical data. This extends discrimination in hiring and limits diversity in the workplace. It is a dangerous cycle that reinforces existing inequalities. Contrary to popular belief, collecting more data is not always a solution. Simply increasing the quantity of the data does not address the underlying issues and can potentially create additional problems such as poverty inequality, privacy issues, lack of local empowerment, limited solution diversity and control. The issue extends beyond bias data. Biases can infiltrate the very design of AI models, choices made during development, unconscious assumptions, and human biases can all find their ways into the models influencing the outcomes. This means that biases persist even if the data is improved. Many believe that regulation is the silver bullet, but it alone isn't sufficient. In fact, we do have laws against discrimination in protected domains, but we need more than just rules. Consider safety-critical fields like medicine, where precise standards and guidelines are exist. Similarly, we require comprehensive framework for AI development to ensure fairness and non-discrimination. And it is not going to happen overnight. Unfortunately, due to the speed of AI development and its dynamic nature, we are still far behind in understanding algorithmic harms. And we have yet to establish all the standards for deployment. So how we can address algorithmic discrimination? Awareness is a key. So the first step is to educate ourselves. I couldn't cover all aspects of algorithmic discrimination in this talk, but I hope more people Raise your hand the next time someone asks this question, whether you heard about algorithmic discrimination. How to take action? As a business owner, 
we must take responsibility by auditing our AI systems, being transparent about their limitations, and actively working to reduce harm. It is crucial to stop deploying models that have not undergone true testing on all subpopulation. As consumers, we must exercise caution, not blindly trust algorithms, and demand more transparency from companies. And as policymakers, I'm not sure if you have policymakers here, we must advocate for standards that incorporate internal and external verification and auditing of AI models. This may require international effort to establish comprehensive guidelines. The existing narrative suggests that considering algorithmic fairness slows down business. This is very wrong. We must recognize the need for breaks to ensure both safety and speed. As inventors, Demanding responsible AI solutions and promoting human-centered AI over profit will not only increase long-term profits because your service benefits more people, but also guarantee a safe and a bright future for our children. Believe me when I say that we can create AI systems that eliminate inequality. However, our current reality is that we are blindly creating powerful AI systems that are dangerous to our society. It is up to us to change this trajectory. Remember, the power to combat algorithmic discrimination lies within each of us. Together, we can shape a world where AI empowers, uplifts, and celebrates the diversity of humanity. Thank you for your attention and for being part of this crucial conversation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Branch, and I lead data analytics and AI at Geotab. So a Geotab is a connected vehicle platform. Uh, we're a Canadian-based company, and we provide data intelligence from 55 billion data points every single day across 3.6 million commercial vehicles to nearly 50,000 customers across the globe. Our goal is simple. It's to make every mile traveled a step towards a greener future. Now, commercial vehicles are the backbone of our global economy, but also contribute about a third of transportation emissions globally. If you take a look at the big three sources of emissions, you know, energy from vehicles, uh, industry, and buildings, and the frequency of replacement of technology, the commercial fleet sector is in the best position to bring about significant transformative change. Unlike you or I who replace our vehicles you know, once or twice a decade, fleets are cycling through these vehicles on an annual basis and can make an impactful decisions to lead to decarbonization at a much quicker pace. So how do we, in this, this vast landscape, start to bring about a greener future? Well, breaking it down, it comes to two primary opportunities. Right. One is what can we do with what we have today? And two is how quickly can you move to a more fuel efficient technology? Now the first involves us uncovering uh, you know, inefficiencies that are hidden like reducing uh, idling and modifying driving behavior in our traditional vehicles. We've been using AI for years. Uh, to help us look at vehicle similarity. Picture a, a constellation of 3.6 million commercial vehicles. What we do is we use AI to cluster how these vehicles maneuver together, grouping different driving patterns like geography, types of vehicles, and more. Once you understand this similarity, you can benchmark behavior and then identify opportunities to improve emissions. The second opportunity takes us on a journey towards electric vehicles. This involves a deep look into a fleet's driving behavior and recommendations as to which they should replace with EVs. In fact, just two years ago, we worked with a partner of ours, Enterprise Fleet Management, and we discovered that 13% of their fleet could transition to EVs. That number today, 45%. Thanks to the, uh, the transformative work that's been done in bringing across new makes and models of EVs. And so for light duty commercial operations, this is not a far off dream. You need only look as far as, you know, Domino's who just last year introduced 800 uh, Chevy Bolts into their ecosystem. Yet, you know, as we dream bigger and look towards these heavy duty trucks, there are challenges, right? 
namely the total cost of ownership and a complex charging infrastructure. Now, as you can see, fleets are not created equal. They range from pickup trucks all the way through to uh, class eight semis. And because of this, fleets are at different stages in their journey for decarbonization. But the good news is they're still driving change. And we're seeing this change. 60% of fleets uh, that use our transportation decarbonization tools have seen a decrease in per mile emissions uh, from 2022, from 2021. But how can we now leverage generative AI in a way to help act as a catalyst for more of a monumental shift? Just like ChatGPT has allowed us to accelerate our productivity, I believe we will see a measurable impact on the way that AI is able to help us accelerate the role of sustainability change agents. And change agents, who are they, right? These, these are the individuals in an organization who have the vision to see beyond the present and the power to drive meaningful change, but have been traditionally hampered by a need for technical expertise to drive these decisions. Generative AI leverages and levels that playing field. And if we can decrease the time to insight for these people, it provides a means for quicker decisions by people who have the power to influence change. Large language models like GPT-4 are incredible experts and been trained in the knowledge they've been given on the vast internet, even though they have been known to stretch the truth once in a while. But what they don't understand is the depth of, uh, in context of a commercial fleet's operations. I see a very near-term future where a fleet manager could ask an AI question like, if I wanted to reduce my carbon footprint this year, what actions might I take? And it might say, you have to take this 20% of your fleet and convert them to EVs. It might say, for this 80% of your fleet, you know, there's nothing we can do right now because there's no EV equivalents, but I've noticed that there's 50 vehicles here that you could uh, tackle from an idling perspective and you could reduce your emissions by 15% over the next year. This isn't new insight, but the delivery method is. Imagine having this intelligence at your fingertips wherever you wanted without the need for any technical assistance. Your change agents become empowered to make decisions around more sustainable solutions faster than ever before. And this is not an in five years thing. This is here and now. In fact, we launched our Project G just last week, which provides a digital assistant that understands a fleet's data and through generative AI already provides some insights into this for a fleet, all in seconds. And all of this, of course, is predicated on having access to the right data context and the right quality. I truly believe there's a world where you could jump into a standard web browser and in Google, simply ask the question, provide me with a detailed five-year decarbonization plan for my fleet. <laughs> and it would provide you with a tailored, highly actionable response based on an understanding of your data. Now, obviously, this is a little bit further out due to data access, privacy, consent implications, but the technology is absolutely there to do this today. We stand at the precipice of, of a new era. Let's imagine a future where the hum of these engines is no longer associated with, with exhaust fumes, but the harmonious rhythm of a planet in balance. Let's empower our sustainability agents to change uh, with AI into making faster, more well-informed decisions. And as we journey on this future together, let's remember that every mile we travel, every decision we make is a step towards a greener, cleaner, and more sustainable future. Thank you, and remember, the future's not just self-driving, it's self-thinking, too. All right, my name's Devin. I'm an emergency doctor at SickKids Hospital, and I'm also a computer scientist in health AI. And it's such an honor to be here. So thank you, Google. Thank you, The Walrus, for the invite and putting this together. And thank you all for coming out to hear us talk. I want to start my talk off with a, a real life story. Um, when I was a junior doctor, I had a patient unfortunately die what I think is a preventable death, partially because they were just waiting too long. I remember getting called to the bedside, doing CPR, and literally feeling that kiddo slip away beneath my hands. It was devastating. It really lit a fire in me. I was angry about this. 
And I remember just thinking, like, what are we going to do about this as a health system? You're, you're such a junior um, person in your career, and it can feel very overwhelming because there's so many factors that contribute to this. But I discovered that if we could unlock the data that sits in our electronic health record systems, there might be opportunities to be able to prevent many cases like this from happening. So let's talk about a use case at SickKids, something that we're actively getting ready uh, to do a clinical trial and test on. What is this use case not? It's not generative AI. This isn't a use case with wide-reaching uh, scope where there's implications of an AI system having um, uncontrollable harms, potentially. A lot of incredible opportunity with generative AI, but that's not what this is. This is a really narrow use case, and I want to open it up with uh, a real story. So imagine you're a parent at home, your kiddo should be outside, playing in the sun, having a good time, but they're in their bed complaining of tummy pain. What do you do, right? A couple days go by, and that parent comes to the emergency department at SickKids. Really common story. They're having tummy pain. The spoiler alert here, unfortunately, this kiddo has appendicitis. They need to get to surgery. But what will happen in the emergency department? They'll wait two to four hours or so, maybe eight. If it's a really bad day, maybe longer than eight hours, right? And I can tell you, the parent knows that this kid might have an appendicitis and that an ultrasound should be done. The triage nurse knows that this kid might have an appendicitis and that an ultrasound should be done. But you're still going to sit waiting for that test to be ordered. So we asked ourselves this question, could we use artificial intelligence, use that data that's available at triage, and actually predict that that patient may need the test? And if we could do that, why don't we just order the test while you're waiting, the, the four to six hours, doing nothing, right? What if we could do that? And we actually demonstrated at SickKids with our research that we can do that and we can do it really, really well. Because it's not rocket science to tell that this kid has appendicitis. The kid's even concerned. They're Googling their symptoms and they're like, ah, appendicitis, <laughs> right? This happens all the time. And so I tell you, I don't need to be an AI genius to build a model to predict appendicitis. And we can do it really well. We're at this exciting phase where we are prospectively deploying this model in a silent trial. What does that mean? It means that we've validated the model. It's running live in the background, but we're just not acting on the results yet. Why? Because we're obsessed with safety. We want to really ensure that when this model is deployed, it's going to do so in a really safe, reliable, accurate way. What else, do we, what else do we need to be obsessed about? Equity, right? What if you speak a different language, and when you come into the hospital, the quality of your triage note is a little bit shorter? Maybe you don't use all the right words that most of our other population uses. Is this AI model still going to predict really well for you? What if you're of a different ethnicity, a different age, different gender? We have to stand proud as a hospital at SickKids and be able to look to the public and say, here is an incredible innovation that's going to save lives, fast track care, address elements of our healthcare crisis, and it's going to work for everyone. And if there's an area where it's not necessarily going to work as well, we have to be transparent about that. Right? So we have to do these bias assessments, these equity assessments. But there's a big problem. I'll tell you right now, these models are working really well. I can't yet deploy them into practice, even though we desperately need them, because we don't have the ethnicity data in our healthcare systems in Canada to do the audit. I can't even ask the question, is this model racist, yes or no? I don't think the model's going to be racist, but you know what I mean. Is there a bias intrinsic in the data that's being captured by this model? I can't ask that question. So we're doing a clinical trial soon, hopefully, if we get the right funding, to then be able to collect that data to demonstrate to the public these tools are safe, they're equitable. But how do you actually get these models into people's hands? So this is where Hero AI comes from. So I'm also the co-founder and CEO of a health tech company in very close partnership with SickKids called Hero AI. I was building these incredibly powerful models from an academic perspective, but you know, don't tell the research institute, I don't really care about the publications. Um, that's one of my KPIs. <laughs> I want to get it to the bedside, right? Hopefully they're not watching. I want to get it to the bedside. And how do you do that? You need to create an application. You need to create web apps, mobile apps. I need to get an application into a patient's hands so that when you arrive to the hospital, you go through triage, you as a patient get an alert that empowers you to choose if you're going to make this next step in your care. Not waiting for a doctor, but giving you the autonomy as a patient, right? That's what we're focused on. And so really proud to say, Hero AI has created one of the world's most agile clinical automation platforms. We just launched today at Collision. We're deployed at SickKids Hospital. Thank you. <laughs>
that, that's really great. Um, we're deployed at SickKids Hospital, and it really represents this ability to go from a really terrible case that happened to get technology into the hands of patients and to really democratize how we leverage AI. But there's a few other considerations. If you get that alert as a patient, and, and you just hit consent, think of all the apps you sign up for, and you're like, sure, consent, consent, consent. That's not really informed consent, right? How do we then actually display information to a family, to a kiddo, to their parent, in a way that genuinely captures informed consent in different languages with the cultural nuance that's needed? I, as a human, when I go talk to a patient, I factor all these things in, in real time. I can tell that my patient's not getting what I'm saying, and then I say it in a different way, and I, I reiterate and I pivot on how I'm communicating, right? That's part of being a great doctor. How do we get AI-based technologies to interface with humans in a way that really is respectful for what we actually do as human providers? And if we can do that, I think that we can really unlock this technology. I think that as Canadians, we owe it to the AI community to take these Canadian values of a cultural mosaic and to ensure that we hold our standards of AI in this country to that bar so that we can translate technologies, transform care, and save lives together. Thank you so much for the time. All right, let's get this in the right position. Okay. <laughs> hey, everyone. <laughs> hey, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Craig Oliva, and I am the Director of Customer Engineering for Google Cloud in Canada. And in my role, uh, I have the privilege of being able to meet organizations across the country and help them transform and modernize the way they operate uh, using cloud. Uh, so today what I'm here to talk about is how the impact of artificial intelligence is having on businesses, really how they're looking at applying it, and I'm gonna share a few use cases and stories. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanna take a step back because just talking to people in the room here and there, I, I get the sense people feel this, this, wow, this stuff is moving at rapid pace. It's very quick, it's new. Um, the reality is AI has been around for a very long time. Uh, many of you use it without knowing it. I would assume everyone here has a smartphone and they might have navigated, their, I navigated my way here today using it. <laughs> um, that's AI driven technology. Um, if you watch Netflix and you fire that up, all those recommendations that you see, that is AI driven. And so it's already in our life, and what we're seeing right now, though, and what we're witnessing is one of the most significant shifts in technological history with generative AI. And this is actually quite a, like an unprecedented, uh, groundbreaking technology. It's one of the biggest shifts in history. And it's going to transform the way that we interact with information, and it's going to transform the way we interact with each other and with organizations and businesses. I think like many of you, I've lived through many technological shifts and in, in history, and you think of the internet, think of mobile, think of cloud, think of AI. These are monumental changes in tech. And what unites all of them under the hood and the stories that unite them all is the value that these technologies ultimately end up unleashing. Um, if you think for businesses today, when we speak to businesses, they're now looking at this technology themselves to, and they're thinking about, well, how do I apply this, this technology that I'm hearing about? And they're looking at five dimensions that they're trying to accomplish and solve for. One is, how do I understand my customers better? How do I engage them better? They're trying to understand, well, how do I attract talent to, to, to my organization and, and stay here? They're looking at how to optimize the way they run, and they're looking at how to connect and collaborate better and innovate better. Ultimately, they, of course, they want to drive profitability and inefficiencies. In Canada, with this specific technology, I think last year when we spoke to organizations, the top question we would get on like generative AI would be things like, um, you know, what is it? What is this technology I'm hearing about? In the span of four months or so in the beginning of this year, that has rapidly shifted to how do I get started as quickly as possible and where should I begin? Right? These are the sorts of questions we're hearing. So let me just share a few examples of how people are using it. You heard some great ones today. Um, but I'll share a couple others. So you probably know the international fast food chain Wendy's. Um, I have, you can tell. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you think of uh, Wendy's, what they wanted to do was transform the drive through experience. So just take a moment and think of your own experience going through a drive through for a minute. You wait in a long line of cars, potentially, you get to an order box, you start speaking what you want to, what you want to order. Now sometimes the person on the other end, at no fault of their own, doesn't hear what you ordered, right? There's a lot of ambient noise, there's cars honking, there's a lot of things going on, so they'll miss it. Sometimes you'll use terminology that they don't know, right? So if I say I want to order a, a JBC, 
which is a junior bacon cheeseburger, uh, they, they, they may not know what that is, right? Um, sometimes you have questions about the ingredients or you want to customize your order. There's a lot of complexity actually in the drive through process. And what they wanted to do is to say, well, how do, we, how do we make this a little more efficient? So they're piloting right now, so we're helping them pilot this in putting artificial intelligence in that ordering mechanism so that when you go through uh, one of these locations, you'd be engaging with an artificial intelligence system. It's gonna sound like a person. They're gonna take your order and it's gonna be able to do all those things like filtering out the background noise. It's gonna be able to understand the strange terminology someone like me might be using. Um, and it's gonna be able to understand the customizations you'd like to have and it'll know all the ingredients. It'll translate that information to the people inside who will focus on making the food. Right? Th this is an actual thing that's being piloted now. Uh, another example is in the healthcare space uh, with John Hopkins University and what they're doing when it comes to brain injuries. So if you think about strokes for a moment, strokes are a leading cause of death. And um, what they found is when someone has a stroke, you need to understand the extent of the damage to the brain, what the right treatment might be, and then how do you assess the effectiveness of the treatments that you're giving. What John Hopkins found was that they, it, typically it would take about five hours to extract that information from a brain scan and then applying artificial intelligence to that problem, they brought that down to 30 seconds, right? Like, just think of the impact that has on saving lives and understanding how to treat people properly. This is an incredible use case there. And then lastly, I'll talk about manufacturing. Um, one of the biggest challenges in manufacturing that you'd see today relates to the challenge of defects, right? These defects in the manufacturing process cost billions of dollars a year, <clears throat> and so, to curb that, you have automotive companies like Renault, Ford Motor Company, even General Motors, are looking at solving that problem by saying, well, how do we use computer vision technologies in the manufacturing facility to catch defects as they happen and before it ever leaves the facility? And so what we're seeing now is things like defects in car parts, uh, issues with paint finish, problems with sheet metal. You name it, they can detect these defects, remediate them on the spot before it ever hits a consumer. That saves billions of dollars, and from a consumer perspective, that makes me happy, and I'm sure it would make many other people happy too, to not have to deal with that. Um, and honestly, this is just a very small slice of how AI is transforming businesses and how they're using it. There's so many use cases we speak to customers every day uh, that they're looking to explore, and you know, we don't know where it'll all go. I will say, though, that as we explore those use cases, it's important to be responsible about it and to look at this technology in a safe way. Right? You've heard that there's possibility of ways that that, that can go wrong. Um, for Google, personally for us, what that means is that we've published uh, our AI principles in 2018. You can, they're on Google, you can look them up and find them. Um, and that means that when we look at deploying AI and advising customers on how to use it, it's about making sure that number one, it's socially beneficial in how it's being used and it's as much as possible, we're not creating or reinforcing bias. Right? This is, this is a, a thing that we're very concerned about. It also means putting safeguards in place. So making sure that the technology can't be used to create deep fakes, to, to create false information, to, to make toxic content. These are things that we want to avoid and make sure that that doesn't happen. <clears throat> so you can see when it's done safely and responsibly, this technology can help businesses drive better experiences, drive down costs and save lives. And the last thing I'll mention is, you know, as a Canadian and many people in this room, what makes me proud is Canada is a pioneer in this space. Like, we really are, an AI perspective. Toronto has the highest concentration of AI startups in the world. Here, right? Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. Montreal, Montreal has the highest concentration of academic researchers in deep learning. Right? These are, these are things, right? Yeah. These are things we should be proud about, and, and we should stand on the strengths of the country and what's happening here. And I think as businesses, as we look to adopt this technology, I think we're gonna be able to compete even better on a global scale. So, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for being here and to the organizers for having me. My name is Mariel Marshall and I have the unique fortune of living a dual life as both an artist and a technology developer. I'd like to start with a quote by one of my favorite sci-fi authors, Nettie Okorafor, and she writes, we'll never know exactly why we are, what we are. All you can do is follow your path 
all the way to the wilderness, and then you continue along. I believe it's time for Canada's nonprofit arts and culture sector to be brave and bold and to venture into the wilderness. We've spun a culture and a narrative around ourselves of relevancy, despite attendance and engagement data that shows otherwise. One third of audiences aren't returning at the levels we saw pre-pandemic. Over the last three years, scientists saved lives, not artists. And okay, yes, Netflix and Disney Plus really helped get us, get me through. But to pretend that our nonprofit art sector played a meaningful part would be, in my opinion, uh, delusional. <laughs> Yet we seem to be holding on to our own sense of self-importance rather than taking a hard look in the mirror and realizing that what got us here, it's not gonna get us there. We're faced with seismic shifts, socially, technologically, ecologically, and artists are uniquely capable and positioned to create the kind of systems change that we need right now. And to do it, we need to shift away from a focus on production and presentation and move towards an innovation mindset. To provide an example of what that could look like, let me tell you about a new project I'm working on, which starts with my friend and colleague, Lucy Simic. Lucy was born in Manitoba, the first child of immigrant parents. Her father, Mile, fled Yugoslavia at the end of the Second World War, and her mother, Heidi, immigrated to Canada from Paraguay to learn English. The couple met at a Latin social club in Winnipeg, and they wasted no time because Lucy was born the following year. <laughs> She's a writer and dancer, and she started Blue Mouth Inc. in 1998 with a group of artists interested in making work in new ways. I had the fortune of joining this collective eight years ago, and it's changed my life. Since the beginning, we've asked audiences to dance the Madison as fast as they can, to sit in a porn theater, to attend a seance in a funeral parlor, or just a couple of years ago, to travel to the Toronto Island by Voyager Canoe. We're not afraid to ask what level of experience are you committed to having. Now, in 2018, at the age of 49, Lucy was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. It's a rare and terminal form that commonly affects young women who are non-smokers. Now, rather than stifle Lucy's creativity, however, the diagnosis has taken her artistry to new heights. And from this horrible situation, she, along with the Blue Mouth team, have continued to make new work. What has emerged is, it's not a performance, really. It's not a play. It's something new, and that's fun. The piece is Lucy's life, told through a collage of movement, of music, of film, and perhaps most importantly, powered by artificial intelligence. We're calling it Lucy AI. And we've teamed up with Reimagine AI, which is a Montreal-based artificial intelligence creative studio, to realize it. What's most significant about this work is that we're creating a, a second soul for Lucy that audiences can interact with in real time. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine you enter a large room, and in the middle of the room is a three-dimensional light sculpture that embodies Lucy. And you're given a tablet, which allows you to interact with her. Tell me about your favorite memory of the ocean, you might ask her. And your question prompts a video projected onto the four walls of the space. And it's a living manifestation of Lucy's intimate memory. How are we making this possible? Well, we train the AI on a resource library of Lucy's thoughts and memories. Writings, photographs, and films captured throughout her life are used to embody her memories and as source material for generative content. In addition to the screens, we also have physical components that evoke Lucy's life. Open a book and hear Lucy talk about why Michael Andache is her favorite author, or hear a story about her father's escape from Yugoslavia in post-World War Yugoslavia, or turn on a lamp and watch a tiny film projected onto the lampshade. Lucy AI is an opportunity for artists to shape a bold new vision for how AI is applied in our lives creatively and culturally. It's a chance for us to ask hard questions. 
What does it mean for AI to be our memory keepers? What will happen to the AI after Lucy is gone? Will I still be able to visit her? Will this become a part of the collective grieving process? The art of tomorrow isn't gonna look like what it did yesterday and that's okay. I've had the chance to speak with hundreds of people about what they love about live arts and culture in my role at Tandem Experiences. And we're doing this so we can understand the DNA, the variables most relevant to a live arts and culture experience so that we can match it to the right audience. Our goal is to be a catalyst for creative discovery and a place for applied AI innovation in curation and recommendation. What I've heard from so many people is that you want connection, you want play, you want fun, you want to be challenged, you want more. And if artists are willing to really listen, we'll hear what you're saying. Business as usual is over. Massive change is here. If we are to remain relevant, we must start asking, how does art create meaning in our lives and develop new ways of understanding? We must become grounded in innovation, in experimentation and R&D if we're to shift to that culture of innovation. And if we do, I think we'll find our way to the wilderness and it will be deeper and more meaningful than anything that has come before. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I am uh, Navneet Alang. I am a writer and educator based here in Toronto. Um, and for the past 15 years or so, I have written about technology for a variety of publications. Um, and when I started out writing about technology, I was quite optimistic. Um, and for reasons that I will explain later, and perhaps reasons that you can guess yourself, I, I'm slightly less optimistic than I used to be. And so I have taken it upon myself to be the skeptic today, and, and uh, I am going to be the wet blanket at the end <laughs> of this event. Um, it is okay, I am used to being unpopular. Um, so there are three things that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, they are the narrative of progress, uh, some of the limits of AI as it currently exists, and I also wanted to maybe engage the slightly philosophical question of what is intelligence? So I wanted to start by returning to the 1990s. I'd like you to cast your memory back to the 1990s. I was wearing a lot of plaid. Uh, I had absolutely ridiculous facial hair. Um, I was listening to a lot of Tool and Rage Against the Machine. If you're old like me, you remember these things. And at the time, there was this thing that people were talking about called the information superhighway, which of course became the internet. Um, and what we were told about the internet was that it was going to be this incredibly revolutionary thing. We were going to become connected. We were going to, going to become informed. Um, uh, life as we knew it was going to change. Now, obviously, the internet has, has, uh, has sort of instigated profound change. There have been enormous benefits to it. But this idea that the internet was this sort of, un, sort of unproblematic good obviously didn't hold. Right? So now that we exist in the 2020s, we know that the internet, in addition to all of its many beneficial qualities, has also instituted a, a number of negative qualities, which is to say there's misinformation, there's increased polarization, uh, there's questions of distraction, the effect of technology on our psychology, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we are hearing currently about artificial intelligence have, tends to mimic that sort of utopian vision of um, the internet, right? So artificial intelligence is here, it's going to change everything, everything is going to be better. Um, and what I would like to suggest is that perhaps we should be a little bit skeptical when uh, the technology industry says we are here to make everything better. Um, one of the things that, okay. Um, people like wet blankets apparently. Um, 
one of the things that proponents of AI uh, have talked about, and it sli sounds slightly paradoxical, so say someone like Sam Altman of OpenAI has, has talked about the risk of AI um, resulting in human extinction, e extinction, which sounds obviously very terrifying. Um, it's worth keeping in mind, I think, that there are a few ways to, to more effectively market how incredible and how powerful and how wonderful your new technology is by saying it's so good, it might accidentally kill us all. Right? Um, so the first thing that I would like to say is that narratives of progress should always be, be viewed with a, a, a little bit of suspicion. Uh, the other thing that I then wanted to, to then move to, obviously it's clear that AI uh, has, is going to have some beneficial consequences, right? Obviously there are positive things, right? So for example, some of the things that Devin and Craig and, and among others have mentioned um, are, are going to be very impressive. So when I first got uh, access to ChatGPT, I did what any reasonable, intelligent, educated person would do. Uh, I asked it to write a limerick about pizza. Um, <laughs> Why did I do that? I could have been hungry, I don't, I don't exactly know. Um, and the limerick that it produced was actually kind of good. It was sort of interesting. Um, just recently, my partner and I were, were sitting down looking out over Lake Ontario. I asked ChatGPT to write a poem about you know, casting your gaze out onto a lake. It was actually reasonably good, as, as poems go. Um, the reason that artificial intelligence, or at least what we currently call artificial intelligence, is good at that kind of thing is because it functions on something called LLMs, right? Large language models. Um, and what those are good at are recognizing patterns within language, the context in within which words appear, and then reproducing that uh, information um, in a sort of contextually appropriate fashion. Um, then, uh, I, keeping that in mind, what I recently did as a writer, being a complete raging narcissist, we all are, um, I asked it to write a biography of, of me. Um, and uh, reading that biography of, of, of myself, what I learned is, is that I was born in India, uh, that I went to Concordia University. Uh, I have been published in the New York Times, um, and, and I quote, his work serves as a guiding light for individuals seeking to navigate the evolving landscape of technology. Uh, unfortunately, none of that is true. Uh, I, I was not born in India. I have, uh, I have regrettably not been published in the New York Times. Uh, and as far as I know, I am not a guiding light to anyone. Um, so the, the second point that I would like to emphasize is that what we currently call AI has some uh, serious flaws, and that is that they will get better over time. Accuracy will improve over time. Um, but what we currently call AI, I don't think you can say in any reasonable sense is intelligence, right? It isn't, it isn't producing knowledge. What it is producing is language, right? The last thing that I just kind of wanted to mention just before I end is this question of intelligence. So if you talk to, uh, or rather if you listen to, some of the sort of most prominent proponents of AI, one of the, the reasons that they are so optimistic is that AI has improved exponentially over the past uh, few years, but particularly within the past year or so. And they will uh, refer to the idea that in intelligence, the, the, the uh, comparative intelligence of these, these systems is also going to prove, improve exponentially. Um, and I think it's worth kind of taking a beat to think about what that means. What would it mean for something to be 10 times or 100 times or 1,000 times more intelligent than another thing, right? Um, what I think those kinds of um, things assume is that uh, the problems that we are facing in society are a result of a lack of intelligence. And so we recently had an election here in Toronto uh, it was an election that was uh, predicated on, a, or, or rather was contested on a number of issues like the housing crisis, affordability, et cetera, et cetera. The idea that AI is going to fix all of those problems assumes that what we are lacking is intelligence. But what we are lacking in, the, in, in regards to those issues is not intelligence. It is political will. It is consensus. It is resources. It is a number of things. And so I think it's worth um, pushing back on the idea that what we actually need is more intelligence. And so I just wanted to end off just by saying that I am someone who has dedicated a lot of his life to technology. I, I, I believe profoundly that technology um, can uh, fundamentally and, and, and quite significantly alter the world. But what I also believe is that it isn't technology ultimately that does the changing. That task is uh, inevitably uh, up to us. And that is it. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Graham Taylor, Dr. Gulnish Farnati, Mike Branch, Dr. Devin Singh, Craig Aliva. Craig, I worked in a drive through for close to four years, and I have stories. <laughs> Muriel Marshall and Navneet Alang. Now I'm going to invite our talkers to stand up and head to the reception. And while they do, I'm going to tell you a bit more about the walrus, but a round of applause for these seven speakers. We like giving them a moment to get to the reception first. So for the rest of you, a bit more about what we're up to at the Walrus. If you enjoyed tonight's talks, and I'm gonna assume that you did, we're gonna be back with more in the fall. So please sign up to our newsletter. It's the best way to stay in touch with the Walrus. If you're here in the room, we have a table. We can set you up there. Otherwise, we have a follow-up email and you can opt in through your inbox. We also encourage you to subscribe to The Walrus. We have a special offer for those of you who are with us tonight. A full year subscription to the print edition, eight issues delivered right to your door for just $25. Just stop by The Walrus table and we'll set you up. For 20 years, The Walrus has been home to Canada's conversation. And as discussed tonight in our increasingly complex world, which includes shrinking newsrooms and encroaching media conglomerates, which is the news right now, our work is more important than ever before. And we're able to continue this work thanks to our community of support. Help us secure the future and consider supporting independent media like The Walrus by making a donation tonight. You can make a donation online at thewalrus.ca, just click on the donate button, or again at this magical table that will serve all of your needs. We're registered, registered charity, so all donations, $20 or more, will receive a tax receipt. Thanks again to the team at Google for making this conversation possible. Also, thank you to our annual sponsors, Air Canada, Inspire, and Rogers. And thanks to each of you here and online for your interest, for your curiosity, for being part of this conversation as it's unfolding. You are a key part of the Walrus community and that connection that we're all looking for. I look forward to continuing this conversation this evening, but also in the months and years ahead. Have a great evening, everyone.